The Poetry of Nature by Charles George Douglas Roberts From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lian Yao Jason in Panama Sonia Thomas Peter and craig franklin when keats wrote the poetry of earth is never dead he enunciated a truth which the world of his own day was hardly ready to accept in its fullness today none would seriously question it regarded subjectively the poetry of earth or in other words the quality which makes for poetry an external nature is that power in nature which moves us by suggestion which excites in us emotion imagination or poignant association which plays upon the tense strings of our sympathies with the fingers of memory or desire this power may reside not less in a bleak pasture lot than in a paradisal close of bloom and verdure not less in the roadside thistle patch than in a peak that soars into the sunset it works through sheer beauty or sheer sublimity but it may work with equal effect through austerity or reticence or limitation or change it may use the most common scenes the most familiar facts and forms as the vehicle of its most penetrating and most illuminating message it is apt to make the drop of dew on a grass glade as significant as the starred concave of the sky the poetry of nature by which i mean this poetry of earth expressed in words may be roughly divided into two main classes that which deals with mere description and that which treats of nature in some one of its many relations with humanity the latter class is that which alone was contemplated in keats's line it has many subdivisions it includes much of the greatest poetry that the world has known and there is little verse of acknowledged mastery that does not depend upon it for some portion of its appeal the former class has but a slender claim to recognition as poetry under any definition of poetry that does not make metrical form the prime essential the failures of the wisest to enunciate a satisfactory definition of poetry make it almost presumptuous for a critic now to attempt the task but from an analysis of these failures one may adduce something roughly to serve the purpose to say that poetry is the metrical expression in words of thought fused in emotion is of course incomplete but it has the advantage of defining no one can think that anything other than poetry is intended by such a definition and nothing is excluded that can show a clear claim to admittance but the poetry of mere enumerative description might perhaps not pass without a challenge so faint is the flame of its emotion so imperfect the fusion of its thought it is verse of this sort that is meant by undiscriminating critics when they inveigh against nature poetry and declare that the only poetry worth man's attention is that which has to do with the heart of man merely descriptive poetry is not very far removed from the work of the reporter and the photographer lacking the selective quality of creative art it is in reality little more than a representation of some of the raw materials of poetry it leaves the reader unmoved because little emotion has gone to its making poetry of this sort at its best is to be found abundantly in thompson's seasons at less than its best it concerns no one nature becomes significant to man when she has passed through the alembic of his heart irrelevant and confusing details have been purged away what remains is single and vital it acts either by interpreting recalling suggesting or symbolizing some phase of human feeling out of the fusing heat born of this contact comes the perfect line luminous unforgettable with something of mystery in its beauty that eludes analysis whatever it be that is brought to the alembic naked hill or barren sand reach sea or meadow weed or star it comes out charged with a new force 
imperishable and active wherever it finds sympathies to vibrate under its currents in the imperishable verse of ancient greece and rome nature poetry of the higher class is generally supposed to play but a small part in reality it is nearly always present nearly always active in that verse but it appears in such a disguise that its origin is apt to be overlooked the greeks and the romans of course following their pattern personified the phenomena of nature till these for all purposes of art became human the greeks made their anthropomorphic gods of the forces of nature which compelled their adoration of these personifications they sang as of men of like passions with themselves but in truth it was of external nature that they made their songs bion's wailing lament for adonis human as it is throughout is in its final analysis a poem of nature by an intense but perhaps unconscious subjective process the ancients supplied external nature with their own moods impulses and passions the transitions from the ancient to the modern fashion of looking at nature are to be found principally in the work of the celtic bards who rather than the cloistered students of that time kept alive the true fire of poetry through the long darkness of the middle ages the modern attitude toward nature as distinguished from that of the greeks begins to show itself clearly in english song very soon after the great revivifying movement which we call the renaissance at first it is a very simple matter indeed men sing of nature because nature is impressing them directly a joyous season calls forth a joyous song summa is ecumenin ludesing cuckoo groweth seed and bloweth mead and springs the wood anew this is the poet's answering hail when the springtime calls to his blood with the fall of the leaf his singing has a sombre and foreboding note and winter in the world makes winter in his song this is nature poetry in its simplest form the form which it chiefly took with the spontaneous elizabethans but it soon became more complex as life and society became entangled in more complex conditions the artificialities of the queen anne period delayed this evolution but with gray and collins we see it fairly in process man looking upon external nature projects himself into her workings his own wrath he apprehends in the violence of the storm his own joy in the loveliness of opening blossoms his own mirth in the light waves running in the sun his own gloom in the heaviness of the rain and wind in all nature he finds but phenomena of himself she becomes but an expression of his hopes his fears his cravings his despair this intense subjectivity is peculiarly characteristic of the nature poetry produced by byron and his school when that titan of modern song apostrophizes the storm thundering over jura he speaks to the tumult in the deeps of his own soul when he addresses the stainless tranquillities of queer placid le mans what moves him to utterance is the contemplation of such a calm as his vexed spirit often craved when man's heart and the heart of nature had become thus closely involved the relationship between them and consequently the manner of its expression in song became complex almost beyond the possibilities of analysis wordsworth's best poetry is to be found in the utterances of the high priest in nature's temple interpreting the mysteries the function of the lines composed a few miles above tintern abbey is to convey to a restless age troubled with small cares seen in too close perspective the large contemplative wisdom which seemed to wordsworth the message of the scene which moved him keats his soul aflame with the worship of beauty was impassioned toward the manifestations of beauty in the world about him and at the same time he used these freely as symbols to express other aspects of the same compelling spirit shelley the most complex of the group sometimes combined all these methods as in the ode to the west wind but he added a new note which was yet an echo of the oldest the note of nature worship 
he saw continually in nature the godhead which he sought and adored youthful protestations and affectations of atheism to the contrary notwithstanding most of shelley's nature poetry carries a rich vein of pantheism allied to that which colors the oldest verse of time and particularly characterizes ancient celtic song with this significant and stimulating revival goes a revival of that strong sense of kinship of the oneness of earth and man which the greeks and latins felt so keenly at times which omar knew and uttered and which underlies so much of the verse of these later days that other unity the unity of man and god which forms so inevitable a corollary to the pantheistic proposition comes to be dwelt upon more and more insistently throughout the nature poetry of the last fifty years the main purpose of these brief suggestions is to call attention to the fact that nature poetry is not mere description of landscape in metrical form but the expression of one or another of many vital relationships between external nature and the deep heart of man it may touch the subtlest chords of human emotion and human imagination not less masterfully than the verse which sets out to be a direct transcript from life the most inaccessible truths are apt to be reached by indirection the divinest mysteries of beauty are not possessed exclusively by the eye that loves or by the lips of a child but are also manifested in some bird song's unforgotten cadence some flower whose perfection pierces the heart some ineffable hue of sunset or sunrise that makes the spirit cry out for it knows not what and whosoever follows the inexplicable lure of beauty in colour form sound perfume or any other manifestation reaching out to it as perhaps a message from some unfathomable past or a premonition of the future knows that the mystic signal beckons nowhere more imperiously than from the heights of nature poetry charles g d roberts end of the poetry of nature by charles george douglas roberts the world is too much with us by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao the world is too much with us sonnet the world is too much with us late and soon getting and spending we lay waste our powers little we see in nature that is ours we have given our hearts away a sordid boon this sea that bears her bosom to the moon the winds that will be howling at all hours and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers for this for everything we are out of tune it moves us not great god i'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn so might i standing on this pleasant lea have glimpses that would make me less forlorn have sight of proteus rising from the sea or hear old triton blow his wreathed horn end of poem this recording is in the public domain earth ocean air from alaster preface by percy bysshe shelley from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao earth ocean air non dum amabam et amare amabam quiribam quid amarum amans amare confessions of saint augustine earth ocean air beloved brotherhood if our great mother has imbued my soul with aught of natural piety to feel your love and recompense the boon with mine if dewy morn and odorous noon and even with sunset and its gorgeous ministers and solemn midnight's tingling silentness 
if autumn's hollow sighs in the sere wind and winter robing with pure snow and crowns of starry ice the grey grass and bare boughs if spring's voluptuous pantings when she breathes her first sweet kisses have been dear to me if no bright bird insect or gentle beast i consciously have injured but still loved and cherished these my kindred then forgive this boast beloved brethren and withdraw no portion of your wonted favour now mother of this unfathomable world favour my solemn song for i have loved thee ever and thee only i have watched thy shadow and the darkness of thy steps and my heart ever gazes on the depth of thy deep mysteries i have made my bed in charnels and on coffins where black death keeps record of the trophies won from thee hoping to still these obstinate questionings of thee and thine by forcing some lone ghost thy messenger to render up the tale of what we are in lone and silent hours when night makes a weird sound of its own stillness like an inspired and desperate alchemist staking his very life on some dark hope have i mixed awful talk and asking looks with my most innocent love until strange tears uniting with those breathless kisses made such magic as compels the charmed knight to render up thy charge and though now yet thou hast unveiled thy inmost sanctuary enough from incommunicable dream and twilight phantasms and deep noonday thought has shone within me that serenely now and moveless as a long-forgotten lyre suspended in the solitary dome of some mysterious and deserted fame i wait thy breath great parent that my strain may modulate with murmurs of the air and motions of the forest and the sea and voice of living beings and woven hymns of night and day and the deep heart of man End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On a Beautiful Day by John Sterling From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia On a Beautiful Day O oh, unseen spirit, now a calm divine comes forth from thee rejoicing earth and air trees hills and houses all distinctly shine and thy great ocean slumbers everywhere the mountain ridge against the purple sky stands clear and strong with darkened rocks and dells and cloudless brightness opens wide and high a home aerial where thy presence dwells the chime of bells remote the murmuring sea the song of birds in whispering copse and wood the distant voice of children's thoughtless glee and maiden songs are all one voice of good amid the leaves green mass a sunny play of flesh and shadow stirs like inward life the ship's white sail glides onward far away unhaunted by a dream of storm or strife end of poem this recording is in the public domain god in nature from paracelsus by robert browning from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox .org by craig franklin god in nature i knew i felt perception unexpressed uncomprehended by our narrow thought but somehow felt and known in every shift and change in the spirit nay in every pore of the body even what god is what we are what life is how god tastes an infinite joy in infinite ways one everlasting bliss from whom all being emanates all power proceeds in whom is life for evermore yet whom existence 
in its lowest form includes where dwells enjoyment there is he with still a flying point of bliss remote a happiness in store afar a sphere of distant glory in full view thus climbs pleasure its heights for ever and for ever the centre fire heaves underneath the earth and the earth changes like a human face the molten ore bursts up among the rocks winds into the stone's heart out branches bright in hidden mines spots barren river beds crumbles into fine sand where sunbeams bask god joys therein the wrath sea's waves are edged with foam white as the bitten lips of hate when in the solitary waste strange groups of young volcanoes come up cyclops like staring together with their bright eyes on flame god tastes a pleasure in their uncouth pride then all is still earth is a wintry clod but spring wind like a dancing sultress passes over its breast to waken it rare verdure buds tenderly upon rough banks between the withered tree roots and the cracks of frost like a smile striving with a wrinkled face the grass grows bright the boughs are swollen with blooms like chrysalids impatient for the air the shining doors are busy beetles run along the furrows ants make their ado above birds fly in merry flocks the lark soars up and up shivering for very joy afar the ocean sleeps white fishing gulls flit where the strand is purple with its tribe of nesting limpets savage creatures seek their loves in wood and plain and god renews his ancient rapture thus he dwells in all from life's minute beginnings up at last to man the consummation of this scheme of being the completion of this sphere of life whose attributes had here and there been scattered o'er the visible world before asking to be combined dim fragments meant to be united in some wondrous whole imperfect qualities throughout creation suggesting some one creature yet to make some point where all those scattered rays should meet convergent in the faculties of man end of poem this recording is in the public domain my heart leaps up by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter my heart leaps up my heart leaps up when i behold a rainbow in the sky so was it when my life began so is it now i am a man so be it when i shall grow old or let me die the child is father of the man and i could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety end of poem this recording is in the public domain Each and All by Ralph Waldo Emerson from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Each and All Little thinks in the field yon red-cloaked clown of thee from the hilltop looking down. The heifer that lows in the upland farm, far heard, lows not thine ear to charm the sexton tolling his bell at noon deems not that great napoleon stops his horse and lists with delight whilst his files sweep round yon alpine height nor knowest thou what argument thy life to thy neighbour's creed has lent all are needed by each one nothing is fair or good alone 
I thought the sparrow's note from heaven, Singing at dawn on the alder bough. I brought him home in his nest at even. He sings the song, but it pleases not now. For I did not bring home the river and sky. He sang to my ear, they sang to my eye. The delicate shells lay on the shore. The bubbles of the latest wave fresh pearls to their enamel gave and the bellowing of the savage sea greeted their safe escape to me. I wiped away the weeds and foam, I fetched my sea-borne treasures home, but the poor unsightly noisome things had left their beauty on the shore, with the sun and the sand and the wild uproar. The lover watched his graceful maid, as mid the virgin train she strayed, nor knew her beauty's best attire was woven still by the snow-white choir at last she came to his hermitage like the bird from the woodlands to the cage the gay enchantment was undone a gentle wife but fairy none then i said i covet truth beauty is unripe childhood's cheat i leave it behind with the games of youth as i spoke beneath my feet the ground pine curled its pretty wreath running over the club moss burrs i inhaled the violet's breath around me stood the oaks and firs pine cones and acorns lay on the ground over me soared the eternal sky full of light and of deity again i saw again i heard the rolling river the morning bird beauty through my senses stole i yielded myself to the perfect whole ralph waldo emerson end of poem this recording is in the public domain the country faith by norman gale from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the country faith here in the country's heart where the grass is green life is the same sweet life as it e'er hath been trust in a god still lives and the bell at morn floats with a thought of god o'er the rising corn God comes down in the rain, and the crop grows tall. This is the country faith, and the best of all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tintin Abbey by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Tintin Abbey. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs. With a soft inland murmur, once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky the day is come when i again repose here under this sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground these orchard tufts which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid grove and copses once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone these beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as in a landscape to a blind man's eye but oft 
in lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities i have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration feelings too of unremembered pleasure such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love nor less i trust to them i may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things if this be but a vain belief yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart how oft in spirit have i turned to thee o sylvan why thou wanderer through the woods how often has my spirit turned to thee and now with gleams of half extinguished thought with many recognitions dim and faint and somewhat of a sad perplexity the picture of the mind revives again while here i stand not only with the sense of present pleasure but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years and so i dare to hope though changed no doubt from what i was when first i came among these hills when like a row i bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature led more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved for nature then the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by to me was all in all i cannot paint what then i was the sounding cataract haunted me like a passion the tall rock the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied nor any interest unborrowed from the eye that time is past and all its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures not for this faint i nor mourn nor murmur other gifts have followed for such loss i would believe abundant recompense for i have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity nor harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue and i have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things all objects of all thought and rolls through all things therefore am i still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear both what they half create and what perceive well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse the guide 
the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being nor perchance if i were not thus taught should i the more suffer my genial spirits to decay for thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river thou my dearest friend my dear dear friend and in thy voice i catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes oh yet a little while may i behold in thee what i was once my dear dear sister and this prayer i make knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her it is her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy for she can so inform the mind that is within us so impress with quietness and beauty and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues rash judgments nor the sneers of selfish men nor greetings where no kindness is nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessing therefore let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee and in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms thy memory be as a dwelling-place for all sweet sounds and harmonies oh then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations nor perchance if i should be where i no more can hear thy voice nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence will thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together and that i so long a worshipper of nature hither came unwearied in that service rather say with warmer love o oh, what far deeper zeal of holier love nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings many years of absence these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this great pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake end of poem this recording is in the public domain great nature is an army gay by richard watson gilder from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by sonia great nature is an army gay great nature is an army gay resistless marching on its way i hear the bugles clear and sweet i hear the tread of million feet across the plain i see it pour it tramples down the waving grass within the echoing mountain pass i hear a thousand cannon roar it swarms within my garden gate my deepest well it drinketh dry it doth not rest it doth not wait by night and day it sweepeth by ceaseless it marches by my door it heeds me not though i implore i know not whence it comes nor where it goes for me it doth not care whether i starve or eat or sleep or live or die or sing or weep and now the banners are all bright now torn and blackened by the fight sometimes its laughter shakes the sky sometimes the groans of those who die still through the night and through the livelong day the infinite army marches on its remorseless way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Come to these scenes of peace by William Lyle Bowles from the world's best poetry, volume five, nature, part one. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. 
Come to these scenes of peace. Come to these scenes of peace, Where, to rivers murmuring, The sweet birds all the summer sing, Where cares and toil and sadness cease. Stranger, does thy heart deplore Friends whom thou wilt see no more? Does thy wounded spirit prove Pangs of hopeless, severed love? Thee the stream that gushes clear, Thee the birds that carol near, Shall soothe, as silent thou dost lie, And dream of their wild lullaby. Come to bless these scenes of peace, Where cares and toil and sadness cease. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the Pleasure Arising from Vicissitude by Thomas Gray From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ode on the Pleasure Arising from Vicissitude Now the golden morn aloft Waves her dew-bespangled wing With vermeil cheek and whisper soft she woos the tardy spring, Till April starts and calls around The sleeping fragrance from the ground, And lightly o'er the living scene Scatters his freshest, tenderest green. Newborn flocks, in rustic dance, Frisking ply their feeble feet, Forgetful of their wintry trance, The birds his presence greet. But chief, the skylark warbles high his trembling, thrilling ecstasy, And lessening from the dazzled sight, Melts into air and liquid light. Yesterday the sullen year saw the snowy whirlwind fly, Mute was the music of the air, the herd stood drooping by. Their raptures now that wildly flow, No yesterday nor morrow know, Tis man alone that joy descries, with forward and reverted eyes. Smiles on past misfortune's brow, Soft reflection's hand can trace, And o'er the cheek of sorrow throw A melancholy grace. While hope prolongs our happier hour, Or deepest shades that dimly lower, And blacken round our weary way, Gilds with a gleam of distant day. Still, where rosy pleasure leads, see a kindred grief pursue, behind the steps that misery treads, approaching comfort view. The hues of bliss more brightly glow, chastised by sabler tints of woe, and blended form with artful strife, the strength and harmony of life. See the wretch that long has tossed on the thorny bed of pain, at length repair his vigor lost, and breathe and walk again. The meanest floweret of the vale, The simplest note that swells the gale, The common sun, the air, the skies, To him are opening paradise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nature by Jones Vary From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama Nature The bubbling brook doth leap when I come by, Because my feet find measure with its call. The birds know when the friend they love is nigh, For I am known to them, both great and small. The flower that on the lonely hillside grows Expects me there when spring its bloom has given, And many a tree and bush my wanderings knows, And e'en the clouds and silent stars of heaven. For he who is with his maker walks aright, Shall be their lord as Adam was before. His ear shall catch each sound with new delight, Each object wear the dress that then it wore. And he, as when erect in soul he stood, Hear from his father's lips that all is good. Jones Vary End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Influence of Natural Objects from the Prelude, 1 by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Influence of Natural Objects Wisdom and Spirit of the Universe, Thou Soul, Thou art the Eternity of Thought, and gives to forms and images a breath and everlasting motion not in vain by day or starlight thus from my first dawn of childhood didst thou intertwine for me the passions that build up our human soul not with the mean and vulgar works of man but with high objects with enduring things with life and nature purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought and sanctifying by such discipline both pain and fear until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart nor was this fellowship vouchsafed to me with stinted kindness in november days when vapors rolling down the valleys made a lonely scene more lonesome among woods at noon and mid the calm of summer nights when by the margin of the trembling lake beneath the gloomy hills homeward i went in solitude such intercourse was mine mine was it in the fields both day and night and by the waters all the summer long and in the frosty season when the sun was set and visible for many a mile the cottage windows through the twilight blazed i heeded not the summons happy time it was indeed for all of us for me it was a time of rapture clear and loud the village clock told six i wheeled about proud and exulting like an untired horse that cares not for his home all shod with steel we hissed along the polished ice in games confederate imitative of the chase and woodland pleasures the resounding horn the pack loud chimed and the hunted hare so through the darkness and the cold we flew and not a voice was idle with the din smitten the precipices rang aloud the leafless trees and every icy crag tinkled like iron while far distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy not unnoticed while the stars eastward were sparkling clear and in the west the orange sky of evening died away not seldom from the uproar i retired into a silent bay or sportively glanced sideways leaving the tumultuous throng to cut across the reflex of a star image that flying still before me gleamed upon the glassy plain and oftentimes when we had given our bodies to the wind and all the shadowy banks on either side came sweeping through the darkness spinning still the rapid line of motion then at once have i reclining back upon my heels stopped short yet still the solitary cliffs wheeled by me even as if the earth had rolled with visible motion her diurnal round behind me did they stretch in solemn train feebler and feebler and i stood and watched till all was tranquil as a summer sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain an indian song by william butler yeats from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. An Indian Song O oh, wanderer in the southern weather, Our isle awaits us, On each lee the peahens dance, In crimson feather, A parrot swaying on a tree, Rages at his own image in the enamelled sea. There dreamy time lets fall his sickle, And life the sandals of her fleetness, 
and sleek young joy is no more fickle and love is kindly and deceitless and all is over save the murmur and the sweetness there we will moor our lonely ship and wander ever with woven hands murmuring softly lip to lip along the grass along the sands murmuring how far away are all earth's feverish lands how we alone of mortals are hid in the earth's most hidden part while grows our love an indian star a meteor of the burning heart one with the waves that softly round us laugh and dart one with the leaves one with the dove that moans and sighs a hundred days how when we die our shades will rove dropping at eve and coral bays a vapory footfall on the ocean's sleepy blaze end of poem this recording is in the public domain the table's turned by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the table's turned up up my friend and quit your books or surely you'll grow double up up my friend and clear your looks why all this toil and trouble the sun above the mountain's head a freshening lustre mellow through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow books tis a dull and endless strife come hear the woodland linnet how sweet his music on my life there's more of wisdom in it and hark how blithe the throstle sings he too is no mean preacher come forth into the light of things let nature be your teacher she has a world of ready wealth our minds and hearts to bless spontaneous wisdom breathed by health truth breathed by cheerfulness one impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man of moral evil and of good than all the sages can sweet is the lore which nature brings our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect enough of science and of art close up those barren leaves come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Rus in Urbe by Clement Scott From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator Jason in Panama as the poets And Craig Franklin as the reckless fellow Rus in Urbe poets are singing the whole world over of may and melody joys for june dusting their feet in the careless clover and filling their hearts with the blackbird's tune the brown bright nightingale strikes with pity the sensitive heart of a count or clown but where is the song for our leafy city and where the rhymes for our lovely town Oh, for the Thames and its rippling reaches, where almond rushes and breezes sport. Take me a walk under Burnham beaches, give me a dinner at Hampton Court. Poets, be still, though your hearts I harden. We flowers by day, and have scents at dark. The limes are in leaf in the cockney garden, and lilacs blossom in Regent's Park. Come for a blow, says a reckless fellow burned red and brown by passionate sun come to the downs where the gorse is yellow the season of kisses has just begun come to the fields where bluebells shiver bear cuckoos carol or plaint of dove come for a row on the silent river come to the meadows and learn to love yes 
I will come when this wealth is over, of softened color and perfect tone, the lilacs better than fields of clover. I'll come when the blossoming May has flown, when dust and dirt of a trampled city have dragged the yellow laburnum down. I'll take my holiday, more's the pity, and turn my back upon London town. Margaret, am I so wrong to love it, this misty town that your face shines through? A crown of blossom is waved above it, but heart and life of the world, tis you, Margaret, Pearl, I have sought and found you, and though the paths of the wind are free, I'll follow the ways of the world around you, and build my nest on the nearest tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fawn, a fragment, by Richard Hovey. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Fawn, a fragment. I will go out to grass with that old king, for I am weary of clothes and cooks. I long to lie along the banks of brooks and watch the boughs above me sway and sing. Come, I will pluck off custom's livery, no longer be a lackey to old time. Time shall serve me, and at my feet shall fling the spoil of listless minutes. I shall climb the wild trees for my food, and run through dale and upland as the fox runs free. Laugh for cool joy and sleep in the warm sun, and men will call me mad like that old king. For I am woodland-natured, and have made dryads my bedfellows, and I have played with the sleek naiads in the splash of the pools, and made a mock of gowned and trousered fools. Helen, none knows better than thou how like a fawn I strayed. And I am half fawn now, and my heart goes out to the forest and the crack of twigs. The drip of wet leaves and the low soft laughter of brooks that chuckle o'er old mossy jests, and say them over to themselves, the nests of squirrels and the holes the chipmunk digs, where through the branches the slant rays dapple with sunlight the leaf matted ground, and the wind comes with blown vestures rustling after, and through the woven lattice of crisp sound a bird's song lightens like a maiden's face. O oh, wildwood Helen! Let them strive and fret, those goggled men with their dissecting knives. Let them in charnel houses pass their lives, and seek in death life's secret. And let those hard-faced wildlings prematurely old, gnaw their thick lips with vain desire to get Portia's fair fame, or Lesbia's carcanet, or crown of Caesar, or Catullus, Apicius's lampreys, or Crassus's gold. For these consider many things, but yet by land or sea they shall not find the way to Arcady, the old home of the awful heart dear mother, where too child dreams and long rememberings lull far from the cares that overlay and smother the memories of old woodland outdoor mirth in the dim first life burst centuries ago, the sense of the freedom and nearness of earth. Nay, this they shall not know. For who goes thither, leaves all the cock and clutch of his soul behind, the doves defiled and the serpent shrined, the hates that wax and the hopes that wither, nor does he journey, seeking where it be, but wakes and finds himself in Arcady. Hist! There's a stir in the brush. Was it a face through the leaves? Back of the laurels a scurry and rush, hillward, then silence, except for the thrush, that throws one song from the dark of the bush, and is gone. And I plunge in the wood, and a swift soul cleaves through the swirl and the flow of the leaves, as a swimmer stands with his white limbs bare to the sun, for the space that a breath is held, and drops in the sea, and the undulant woodland folds around me, intimate, fluctuant, free, like the clasp and the cling of the waters, and the reach and the effort is done. There is only the glory of living, 
exalted to be a goodly damp smell of the ground a rough sweet bark of the trees O oh, clear sharp cracklings of sound O oh, life that's a thrill and a bound with a vigour of boyhood and morning and the noontide's rapture of ease was there ever a weary heart in the world a lag in the body's urge or a flag of the spirit's wings did a man's heart ever break for a lost hope's sake for here there is lilt in the quiet and calm and the quiver of things i this old oak grey-grown and gnarled solemn and sturdy and big is as young of heart as alert and elate in his rest as the nuthatch there that clings to the tip of the twig and scolds as the wind that buffets too rudely its nest oh what is it breathes in the air oh what is it touches my cheek there's a sense of a presence that lurks in the branches but where is it far is it far to seek end of poem this recording is in the public domain invocation to light from paradise lost book three by john milton from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter invocation to light from paradise lost book three hail holy light offspring of heaven first born or of the eternal co-eternal beam may i express thee unblamed since god is light and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity dwelt then in thee bright effluence of bright essence increate or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream whose fountain who shall tell before the sun before the heavens thou wert and at the voice of god as with a mantle did invest the rising world of waters dark and deep one from the void and formless infinite thee i revisit now with bolder wing escape the stygian pool though long detained in that obscure sojourn while in my flight through utter and through middle darkness born with other notes than to the orphean lyre i sung of chaos and eternal night taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend though hard and rare thee i revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp but thou revisitest not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn so thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled yet not the more cease i to wander where the muses haunt clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill smit with the love of sacred song but chief thee scion and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow nightly i visit nor sometimes forget those other two equalled with me in fate so were i equalled with them in renown blind thamyris and blind meonides and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets old. Then feed on thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers, as the wakeful bird sings darkling, and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus with the year's seasons return, but not to me returns day, or the sweet approach of even or morn, or sight of vernal bloom, or summer's rose, or flocks or herds or human face divine but cloud instead and ever during dark surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off and for the book of knowledge fair presented with a universal blank of nature's works to me expunged and raised and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out so much the rather thou celestial light shine inward 
and the mind through all her powers irradiate there plant eyes all mist from thence purge and disperse that i may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight end of poem this recording is in the public domain light from paradise lost book seven by john milton from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin light let there be light god said and forth with light ethereal first of things quintessence pure sprung from the deep and from her native east to journey through the airy gloom began sphered in a radiant cloud for yet the sun was not she in a cloudy tabernacle sojourned the while god saw the light was good and light from darkness by the hemisphere divided light the day and darkness night he named end of poem this recording is in the public domain Light by George MacDonald from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Light, thou art the joy of age. Thy sun is dear when long the shadow falls. Forth to its friendliness the old man crawls, and, like the bird hung in his poor cage to gather song from radiance, in his chair sits by the door and sitteth there his soul within him like a child that lies half dreaming with half open eyes at close of a long afternoon in summer high ruins around him ancient ruins where the raven is almost the only comer half dreams half broods in wonderment at thy celestial descent through rifted loops alighting on the gold that waves its bloom in many an airy rent so dreams the old man's soul that is not old but sleepy mid the ruins that enfold what soul-like changes evanescent moods upon the face of the still passive earth its hills and fields and woods thou with thy seasons and thy hours art ever calling forth even like a lord of music bent over his instrument who gives to tears and smiles an equal birth when clear as holiness the morning ray casts the rock's dewy darkness at its feet mottling with shadows all the mountain gray when at the hour of sovereign noon infinite silent cataracts sheet shadowless through the air of thunder breeding june and when the yellower glory slanting passes twixt longer shadows o'er the meadow grasses when now the moon lifts up her shining shield high on the peak of a cloud hill revealed now crescent lo wandering sun dazed away unconscious of her own star mingled ray her still face seeming more to think than see makes the pale world lie dreaming dreams of thee no mood of mind no melody of soul but lies within thy silent soft control of operative single power and simple unity the one emblem yet all the colors that our passionate eyes devour in rainbow moonbow or in opal gem are the melodious descant of divided thee lo thee in yellow sands lo thee in the blue air and sea in the green corn with scarlet poppies lit thy half souls parted patient thou dost sit lo thee in speechless glories of the west lo thee in dewdrops tiny breast thee on the vast white cloud that floats away bearing upon its skirt a brown moon ray regent of color thou dost fling thy overflowing skill on everything 
the thousand hues and shades upon the flowers are all the pastime of thy leisure hours and all the jewelled oars in mines that hidden be are dead till touched by thee george macdonald end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Northern Lights by Benjamin Franklin Taylor From The World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Northern Lights To claim the Arctic came the sun With banners of the burning zone Unrolled upon their airy spars They froze beneath the light of stars and there they float, those streamers old, those northern lights, for ever cold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poem from the Hymn to Light by Abraham Cowley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin From the Hymn to Light Say, from what golden quivers of the sky Do all thy winged arrows fly? Swiftness and power by birth are thine, From thy great sire they came, Thy sire, the word divine. Thou in the moon's bright chariot, Proud and gay, dost thy bright wood Of stars survey, and all the year dost with thee bring of thousand flowery lights thine own nocturnal spring. Thou Scythian like dost thou, but be be be. Thou Scythian like dost round thy lands above the sun's gilt tent for ever move, and still as thou in prompt dost go, the shining pageants of the world attend thy show nor amidst all these triumphs dost thou scorn the humble glow-worms to adorn and with those living spangles gild o oh, greatness without pride the bushes of the field night and her ugly subjects thou dost fright and sleep the lazy owl of night ashamed and fearful to appear they screen their horrid shapes with the black hemisphere at thy appearance grief itself it said to shake his wings and rouse his head and cloudy care has often took a gentle beamy smile reflected from thy look at thy appearance fear itself grows bold the sunshine melts away his cold encouraged at the sight of thee to the cheek colour comes and firmness to the knee when goddess thou lifts up thy wakened head out of the morning's purple bed thy choir of birds about thee play and all the joyful world salutes the rising day all the world's bravery that delights our eyes is but thy several liveries thou the rich dye on them bestowest thy nimble pencil paints this landscape as thou goest a crimson garment in the rose thou wearest a crown of studded gold thou bearest the virgin lilies in their white are clad but with the lawn of almost naked light the violet springs little infant stands girt in thy purple swaddling bands on the fair tulip thou dost dote thou clothest it in a gay and party-coloured coat through the soft ways of heaven and air and sea which open all their pores to thee like a clear river thou dost glide and with thy living streams through the close channel slide but the vast ocean of unbounded day in the empyrean heaven dost stay thy rivers lakes and springs below from thence took first their rise thither at last must flow end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Daybreak 
by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as narrator And Sonia as the wind Daybreak A wind came up out of the sea and said, O oh, mists, make room for me it hailed the ships and cried sail on ye mariners the night is gone and hurried landward far away crying awake it is the day it said unto the forest shout hang all your leafy banners out it touched the woodbird's folded wing and said o bird awake and sing and o'er the farms o oh, chanticleer your clarion blow the day is near it whispered to the fields of corn bow down and hail the coming morn it shouted through the belfry tower awake o oh bell proclaim the hour it crossed the churchyard with a sigh and said not yet in quiet lie End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dawn by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Dawn The night was dark though sometimes a faint star a little while a little space made bright the night was long and like an iron bar lay heavy on the land till o'er the sea slowly within the east there grew a light which half was starlight and half seemed to be the herald of a greater the pale white turned slowly to pale rose and up the height of heaven slowly climbed the grey sea grew rose-coloured like the sky a white gull flew straight toward the utmost boundary of the east where slowly the rose gathered and increased it was as on the opening of a door by one that in his hand a lamp doth hold whose flame is hidden by the garment's fold the still air moves the wide room is less dim more bright the east became the ocean turned dark and more dark against the brightening sky sharper against the sky the long sea line the hollows of the breakers on the shore were green like leaves whereon no sun doth shine though white the outer branches of the tree from rose to red the level heaven burned then sudden as if a sword fell from on high a blade of gold flashed on the horizon's rim end of poem this recording is in the public domain morning song by joanna bailey from the world's best poetry volume five Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Morning Song. Up quid thy bar late wears the hour? Long have the rooks called round the tower. O oh, flower and tree, loud hums the bee, and the wild kid sports merrily. The sun is bright, the sky is clear. Wake, lady, wake and hasten here. Up, maiden fair, and bind thy hair, and rouse thee in the breezy air. The lulling stream that soothes thy dream is dancing in the sunny beam. Waste not these hours so fresh, so gay. Leave thy soft couch and haste away. Up time will tell the morning bell, its service sound has chimed well. The aged crone keeps house alone, the reapers to the fields are gone. 
lose not these hours so cool so gay lo while thou sleeps they haste away end of poem this recording is in the public domain morning by john cunningham from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter morning in the barn the tenant cock close to partlet perched on high briskly crows the shepherd's clock jocund that the morning's nigh swiftly from the mountain's brow shadows nursed by night retire and the peeping sunbeam now paints with gold the village spire Philomel forsakes the thorn, plaintive where she prates at night, and the lark, to meet the morn, soars beyond the shepherd's sight. From the low-roofed cottage ridge, see the chattering swallow spring, darting through the one-arched bridge, quick she dips her dappled wing. Now the pine tree's waving top gently greets the morning gale. Kidlings now begin to crop, daisies on the dewy dale. From the balmy sweets, uncloyed, restless till her task be done, now the busy bees employed, sipping dew before the sun. Trickling through the creviced rock, where the limpid stream distills, sweet refreshment waits the flock when tis sun drove from the hills. Collins for the promised corn, ere the harvest hopes are ripe, anxious, whilst the huntsman's horn, boldly sounding, drowns his pipe. Sweet, oh sweet, the warbling throng, on the white and blossom spray, nature's universal song, echoes to the rising day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pack Clouds Away by Thomas Hayward From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Pack Clouds Away Pack clouds away, and a welcome day, With night we banish sorrow. Sweet air, blow soft, mount lark aloft, To give my love good morrow. Wings from the wind to please her mind, Notes from the lark I'll borrow. Bird, prune thy wing, Nightingale, sing, To give my love good morrow, To give my love good morrow, Notes from them all I'll borrow. Wake from thy nest, Robin red breast, Sing, birds in every furrow, And from each hill let music shrill, Give my fair love good morrow. Blackbird and thrush in every bush, Stare linnet and cock sparrow, You petty elves amongst yourselves, Sing my fair love good morrow, To give my love good morrow, Sing birds in every furrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morning from the Minstrel by James Beatty From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Morning But who the melodies of morn can tell? The wild brook babbling down the mountain side, The lowing herd, the sheepfold's simple bell, The pipe of early shepherd dim descried, In the lone valley echoing far and wide. The clamorous horn along the cliffs above, The hollow murmur of the ocean tide, The hum of bees, the linnet's lay of love, And the full choir that wakes the universal grove. The cottage curs at early pilgrim bark, Crowned with her pail, the tripping milkmaid sings, The whistling ploughman stalks a field, And hark, down the rough slope the ponderous wagon rings. Through rustling corn, the hare astonished springs, 
slow tolls the village clock the drowsy hour the partridge bursts away on whirring wings deep mourns the turtle in sequestered bower and shrill lark carols clear from her aerial tower end of poem this recording is in the public domain summer rain by hartley coleridge from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by sonia summer rain thick lay the dust uncomfortably white in glaring mimicry of arab sand the woods and mountains slept in hazy light the meadows looked athirst and tawny tanned the little rills had left their channels bare with scarce a pool to witness what they were and the shrunk river gleamed mid oozy stones that stared like any famished giant's bones sudden the hills grew black and hot as stove the air beneath it was a toil to be there was a growling as of angry jove provoked by juno's prying jealousy a flash a crash the firmament was split and down it came in drops the smallest fit to drown a bee in foxglove bell concealed joy filled the brook and comfort cheered the field end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Oasis of Sidi Khaled by Wilfred Scorn Blunt From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Oasis of Sidi Khaled How the earth burns, each pebble underfoot Is as a living thing with power to wound the white sand quivers and the footfall mute of the slow camels strikes but gives no sound as though they walked on flame not solid ground tis noon and the beasts shadows even have fled back to their feet and there is fire around and fire beneath and the sun overhead pitiful heaven what is this we view tall trees a river pools where swallows fly thickets of oleander where doves coo shades deep as midnight greenness for tired eyes hark how the light winds in the palm tops sigh oh this is rest oh this is paradise end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Midsummer's Noon in the Australian Forest by Charles Harper from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. A Midsummer's Noon in the Australian Forest. Not a sound disturbs the air, there is quiet everywhere. Over plains and over woods, what a mighty stillness broods! All the birds and insects keep where the coolest shadows sleep. Even the busy ants are found resting in their pebbled mound. Even the locust clingeth now silent to the barky bough. Over hills and over plains, quiet, vast, and slumberous reigns. Only there's a drowsy humming from yon warm lagoon slow coming. Tis the dragon hornet, see? all bedaubed resplendently yellow on a tawny ground each rich spot not square nor round rudely heart-shaped as it were the blurred and hasty impress there of a vermeil crusted seal dusted o'er with golden meal only there's a droning where yon bright beetle shines in air tracks it in its gleaming flight with a slanting beam of light 
Rising in the sunshine higher, Till its shards flame out like fire. Every other thing is still, Save the ever-wakeful rill, Whose cool murmur only throws Cooler comfort round repose, Or some ripple in the sea, Of leafy boughs, where, Lazily, tired summer, In her bower, Turning with the noontide hour, Heaves a slumbrous breath, Ere she once more slumbers peacefully. Oh, tis easeful here to lie, Hidden from noon's scorching eye, In this grassy cool recess, Musing thus of quietness. Charles Harper End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. Noontide by John Layden from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Noontide, beneath a shivering canopy reclined of aspen leaves that wave without a wind, I love to lie when lulling breezes stir the spiry cones that tremble on the fir, or wander mid the dark green fields of broom when peers in scattered tufts the yellow bloom or trace the path with tangling firs overrun when bursting seed-bells crackle in the sun and pittering grasshoppers confusedly shrill pipe giddily along the glowing hill sweet grasshopper who loves that noon to lie serenely in the green-ribbed clover's eye to sun thy filmy wings and emerald vest unseen thy form and undisturbed thy rest oft have i listening mused the sultry day and wondered what thy chirping song might say when naught was heard along the blossomed lea to join thy music save the listless bee end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Summer Noon by William Howitt From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao A Summer Noon Who has not dreamed a world of bliss On a bright sunny noon like this? Couched by his native brick's green maze With comrade of his boyish days While all around them seemed to be just as in joyous infancy who has not loved at such an hour upon that heath in birchen bower lulled in the poet's dreamy mood its wild and sunny solitude while o'er the waste of purple ling you mark a sultry glimmering silence herself there seems to sleep wrapped in a slumber long and deep where slowly stray those lonely sheep through the tall foxglove's crimson bloom, And gleaming the scattered broom. Love you not, then, to list and hear The crackling of the gorse flowers near, Pouring an orange-scented tide Of fragrance o'er the desert wide, To hear the buzzards whimpering shrill Hovering above you high and still, The twittering of the bird that dwells Among the heath's delicious bells, while round your bed o'er fern and blade insects in green and gold arrayed the sun's gay tribes have lightly strayed and sweeter sound their humming wings than the proud minstrel's echoing strings end of poem this recording is in the public domain the midges dance aboon the burn by Robert Tannahill, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The midges dance aboon the burn. The midges dance aboon the burn. The dews begin to fa'. The pair tricks down their rushy home, set up their e'en and ca. Now loud and clear the blackbird sang, rings through the briery shore. While flitting gay the swallows play around the castle wall. 
Beneath the golden globe and sky, the mavis mends her lay. The red breast pours his sweetest strains to charm the lingering day. While weary yeldren seem to wail their little nestlings torn, the merry wren, frae den to den, gaze jinking through the thorn. The roses foul their silken leaves, the foxglove shuts its bell, the honeysuckle and the bark spread fragrance through the dell. Let others crowd the giddy court of mirth and revelry. The simple joys that nature yields are dearer far to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sunset by Percy Bysshe Shelley From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Sunset from Queen Mab If solitude hath ever led thy steps To the wild ocean's echoing shore, And thou hast lingered there, until the sun's broad orb seemed resting on the burnished wave thou must have marked the lines of purple gold that motionless hung o'er the sinking sphere thou must have marked the billowy clouds edged with intolerable radiancy towering like rocks of jet crowned with a diamond wreath and yet there is a moment when the sun's highest point peeps like a star o'er ocean's western edge when those far clouds of feathery gold shaded with deepest purple gleam like islands in a dark blue sea then has thy fancy soared above the earth and furled its wearied wing within the fairy's fane yet not the golden islands gleaming in yon flood of light nor the feathery curtains stretching o'er the sun's bright couch nor the burnished ocean's waves paving that gorgeous dome so fair so wonderful a sight as mab's ethereal palace could afford yet likest evening's vault that fairy hall heaven low resting on the wave it spread its floors of flashing light its vast and azure dome its fertile golden islands floating on a silver sea whilst suns their mingling beamings darted through clouds of circumambient darkness and pearly battlements around looked o'er the immense of heaven end of poem this recording is in the public domain fancy in nubibus by samuel taylor coldridge from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox.org by craig franklin fancy in nubibus oh it is pleasant with a heart at ease just after sunset or by moonlight skies to make the shifting clouds be what you please or let the easily persuaded eyes own each quaint likeness issuing from the mould of a friend's fancy or with head bent low and cheek aslant see rivers flow of gold twixt crimson banks and then a traveller go from mount to mount through cloudland gorgeous land or listen to the tide with closed sight be that blind bard who on the kian strand by those deep sounds possessed with inward light beheld the iliad and the odyssey rise to the swelling of the voiceful sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain day is dying from the spanish gypsy by marion evans lewis cross George Eliot, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Day is dying, from the Spanish Gypsy. Day is dying, float, O oh song, 
down the westward river requiem chanting to the day day the mighty giver pierced by shafts of time he bleeds melted ruby sending through the river and the sky earth and heaven bleeding all the long-drawn earthy banks up to cloudland lifting slow between them drifts the swan twixt to heavens drifting wings half open like a flower inly deeper flushing neck and breast as virgins pure virgin proudly blushing day is dying float o swan down the ruby river follow song in requiem to the mighty giver end of poem this recording is in the public domain the end of the day by duncan campbell scott from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by sonia as the narrator lian yao as the bowels and thomas peter as the hermit thrush the end of the day i hear the bells at eventide peal softly one by one near and far off they break and glide across the stream float faintly beautiful the antiphonal bells of hull the day is done 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 the day is done the dew has gathered in the flowers like tears from some unconscious deep the swallows whirl around the towers the light runs out beyond the long cloud bars and leaves the single stars tis time for sleep 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 tis time for sleep the hermit thrush begins again timorous eremite that song of risen tears and pain as if the one he loved was far away alas another day and now good night good night good night end of poem this recording is in the public domain Evening by Archibald Lampman from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Evening From upland slopes I see the cows file by, lowing, great-chested, down the homeward trail, by dusking fields and meadows shining pale with moon-tipped dandelions flickering high a peevish nighthawk in the western sky beats up into the lucent solitudes or drops with grinding wing the stilly woods grow dark and deep and gloom mysteriously cool night winds creep and whisper in mine ear the homely cricket gossips at my feet from far-off pools and wastes of reeds i hear with ebb and change the chanting frogs break sweet in full pandean chorus one by one shine out the stars and the great night comes on archibald lampman end of poem this recording is in the public domain a twilight fancy by dora reed goodale from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin a twilight fancy i sit here and the earth is wrapped in snow and the cold air is thick with falling night i think of the still dewy summer eves when cows came slowly sauntering up the lane waiting to nibble at the juicy grass when the green earth was full of changing life when the warm wind blew soft and slowly past 
caressing now and then some wayside flower stopping to stir the tender maple leaves and breathing all its fragrance on the air i think of the broad meadows daisy white with the long shade of some stray apple tree falling across them and the rustlings faint when evening breezes shook along the grass i think of all the thousand summer sounds the crickets chirp repeated far and near the sleepy note of robins in their nest the whip poor will whose sudden cry rang out plaintive yet strong upon the startled air and so it was the summer twilight fell and deepened to the darkness of the night and now i lift my heart out of my dream and see inside the pale cold dying lights the dull gray skies the barren snow-clad fields that come to us when winter evenings come end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the evening star by thomas campbell from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for LibriVox.org by lian yao to the evening star star that bringest home the bee and sets the weary labourer free if any star shed peace tis thou that sensed it from above appearing when heaven's breath and brow are sweet as hers we love come to the luxuriant skies whilst the landscape's odours rise whilst far off lowing herds are heard and songs when toil is done from cottages where smoke unstirred curls yellow in the sun star of love's soft interviews parted lovers on thee muse their remembrancer in heaven of thrilling vows thou art too delicious to be riven by absence from the heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Evening Wind by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Evening Wind Spirit that breathest through my lattice, Thou that cools the twilight of the sultry day, Gratefully flows thy freshness round my brow, Thou hast been out upon the deep at play, riding all day the wild blue waves till now roughening their crests and scattering high their spray and swelling the white sail i welcome thee to the scorched land thou wanderer of the sea nor i alone a thousand bosoms round inhale thee in the fullness of delight and languid forms rise up and pulses bound livelier at coming of the wind of night and languishing to hear thy welcome sound lies the vast inland stretched beyond the sight go forth into the gathering shade go forth god's blessing breathed upon the fainting earth go rock the little wood bird in his nest curl the still waters bright with stars and rouse the wide old wood from his majestic rest summoning from the innumerable boughs the strange deep harmonies that haunt his breast pleasant shall be thy way where meekly bows the shutting flower and darkling waters pass and where the overshadowing branches sweep the grass stoop over the place of graves and softly sway the sighing herbage by the gleaming stone that they who near the churchyard willows stray and listen in the deepening gloom alone may think of gentle souls that passed away like thy pure breath into the vast unknown sent forth from heaven among the sons of men and gone into the boundless heaven again the faint old man shall lean his silver head to feel thee thou shalt kiss the child asleep and dry the moistened curls that overspread his temples while his breathing grows more deep and they who stand about the sick man's bed 
shall joy to listen to thy distant sweep and softly part his curtains to allow thy visit grateful to his burning brow go but the circle of eternal change which is the life of nature shall restore with sounds and scents from all thy mighty range thee to thy birthplace of the deep once more sweet odours in the sea air sweet and strange shall tell the homesick mariner of the shore and listening to thy murmur he shall deem he hears the rustling leaf and running stream end of poem this recording is in the public domain evening in paradise by milton from the world's vast poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by lian yao evening in paradise from paradise lost book four now came still evening on and twilight gray had in her sober livery all things clad silence accompanied for beast and bird they to their grassy couch these to their nests were slunk all but the wakeful nightingale she all night long her amorous descant sung silence was pleased now glowed the firmament with living sapphires hesperus that led the starry host rode brightest till the moon rising in clouded majesty at length apparent queen unveiled her peerless light and o'er the dark her silver mantle threw end of poem this recording is in the public domain evening from don juan by lord byron from the world's best poetry volume five nature part one read for librivox dot org by thomas peter Evening, from Don Juan. Ave Maria, o'er the earth and sea, that heavenliest hour of heaven is worthiest thee. Ave Maria, blessed be the hour, the time, the clime, the spot, where I so oft have felt that moment in its fullest power sink o'er the earth so beautiful and soft or swung the deep bell in the distant tower or the faint dying day hymn stole aloft and not a breath crept through the rosy air and yet the forest leaves seemed stirred with prayer ave maria tis the hour of prayer ave maria tis the hour of love ave maria may our spirits dare look up to thine and to thy sons above ave maria oh that face so fair those downcast eyes beneath the almighty dove but though tis but a pictured image strike that painting is no idol tis too like sweet hour of twilight in the solitude of the pine forest and the silent shore which bounds ravenna's immemorial wood rooted where once the adrian way flowed o'er to where the last caesarian fortress stood evergreen forest which boccaccio's lore and dryden's lame made haunted ground to me how have i loved the twilight hour and thee the shrill chicalis people of the pine making their summer lives one ceaseless song where the soul echoes save my steeds and mine and vesper bells that rose the boughs along the spectre huntsman of onesti's line his hell dogs and their chase and the fair throng which learned from this example not to fly from a true lover shadowed my mind's eye o oh, hesperus thou bringest all good things home to the weary to the hungry cheer to the young bird the parents brooding wings 
the welcome stall to the o'er-laboured steer whate'er of peace about our hearthstone clings whate'er our household gods protect of dear are gathered round us by thy look of rest thou bring'st the child too to the mother's breast soft hour which wakes the wish and melts the heart of those who sail the seas on the first day when they from their sweet friends are torn apart or fills with love the pilgrim on his way as the far bell of vesper makes him start seeming to weep the dying day's decay is this a fancy which our reason scorns ah surely nothing dies but something mourns end of poem this recording is in the public domain moonlight on the prairie by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 1 read for librivox.org by jason in panama as the narrator Lian Yao as the maiden Craig Franklin as the Oaks, and Sonia as the Meadow. Moonlight on the Prairie from Evangeline. Beautiful was the night. Behind the black wall of the forest, tipping its summit with silver, arose the moon. On the river fell here and there through the branches a tremulous gleam of the moonlight, like the sweet thoughts of love on a darkened and devious spirit nearer and round about her the manifold flowers of the garden poured out their souls in odours that were their prayers and confessions unto the night as it went its way like a silent carthusian fuller of fragrance than they and as heavy with shadows and night dews hung the heart of the maiden the calm and the magical moonlight seemed to inundate her soul with indefinable longings as through the garden gate and beneath the shade of the oak trees passed she along the path to the edge of the measureless prairie silent it lay with a heavy gaze upon it and fireflies gleaming and floating away in mingled and infinite numbers over her head the stars the thoughts of god in the heavens shone on the eyes of man who had ceased to marvel and worship save when a blazing comet was seen on the walls of that temple as if a hand had appeared and written upon them a parson and the soul of the maiden between the stars and the fireflies wandered alone and she cried o oh, gabriel o oh, my beloved art thou so near unto me and yet i cannot behold thee art thou so near unto me and yet thy voice does not reach me Ah. Oh how often thy feet have trod this path to the prairie oh how often thine eyes have looked on the woodlands around me ah oh, how often beneath this oak returning from labour thou hast lain down to rest and to dream of me in thy slumbers when shall these eyes behold these arms be folded about thee loud and sudden and near the note of a whippoorwill sounded like a flute in the woods and anon through the neighbouring thickets farther and farther away it floated and dropped into silence patience whispered the oaks from oracular caverns of darkness and from the moonlit meadow a sigh responded to-morrow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.